to the afternoon. Owen caught up with Joe Brawley and MP John Finucane in Belfast City Centre to find out where we're at on the redevelopment of Casement Park at the moment. First, let's have a listen to Joe Brawley speaking with Owen Sheehan. The, the history of it's important so that um, the Casement Park project was, if you like, uh, uh, it was going to be a sort of a compensation for, you know, 30 years of neglect of the GAA and um, the fact that we were entirely self-help. There were, I think, 1,000 council soccer pitches and I think two council GA pitches. So, you know, you were, you were coming from a history of discrimination and neglect. And what happened with Gaston Park was that in order to make it a cross-community project, the GA effectively brought rugby and soccer with us. And soccer got their new stadium. Rugby got their new stadium and the GA is still casement, has got elephant grass and is infested with rats and, you know, what was a, what was such a vibrant, vibrant place to play football whenever I was playing. I mean, we played down in the Ulster semi-final there in 1982. It was like an All-Ireland final, 40,000 people there. What an atmosphere, what a place to play a game, a brilliant surface and all of that. So that's the history of it. The real problem has been that the GA hasn't, in my view, understood how to properly engage with the residents. I think it would have been easily done. They could have built up tremendous goodwill if they'd had the right people dealing with them. And what we see is that the residents, a small number of residents, admittedly, have felt backed into a corner and have... Uh, and it's a bit like a neighbour dispute that goes on forever and no one can remember how it started. You know, they take up entrenched positions and then it becomes their daily life, their daily obsession. And so whenever the planning permission was granted the first time, the residents immediately engaged. Like, <laughs> it's, it's always a good idea to, if you're going to judicial review, to engage the man who wrote the book on judicial review, yeah. which is exactly what Mr Justice Schofield, he was then just... Mr. Schofield was, he was the leading authority in judicial review here, uh, picked it apart and uh, the project was struck down. Now we're back again, planning permission has been granted again by Nicola Mallon and now um, there's a new QC on behalf of the residents. Again, I feel strongly that the, this could be resolved mm. because but for the residents' objections uh, and the judicial review you know, we'd now be laying the foundations for this magnificent new stadium that we badly need in West Belfast mm -hmm. and in the greater Belfast area just to regenerate all of that area. Theoretically believe in in the power of, of sport for good in a not not in a place like this, but in, in all uh, places around the world because it gets spoken up about, it gets glorified so much when a Euros bid is the headline grabbing thing, you know, bringing people together and all that. Well, it's a power for, I mean, it's certainly a power for good in the amateur context. Mm -hmm. I mean, professional sport is, 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 is truthfully an ugly place. You know, it does bring people joy to a certain extent uh, and all of that. And there's no doubt that it is, a, 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 you know, there is, it is a power for good on the whole. But in our context, I mean, sport has a dramatic transformational effect on our communities, our families. The, fact, the building block of society is I know you and you know me. Now, if you're a GA man anywhere in the world, I might not actually know you but I know you. I go to Boston or I go to Moscow, the Seamus Heaney GA club, I go anywhere like that. If you're a GA man anywhere in the world, you'll be accepted. You'll have a place to stay. You'll have a job. You know, that sense of community is unrivaled. And in Belfast, particularly in West Belfast, where you've got about, say, you've 12 clubs, most of them have very poor facilities. A lot of them would be hoping in due course that they'd be able to use the new casement every now and again, which will happen because it's going to be a community hub. That's already been made clear. And the fact that we would have something to rival any other sport, like Croke Park, and you got that, you say, wow, well, come on. You know, there are feelings of pride that come from that. It's brilliant. It's easy to motivate kids to say, look, we could be there someday. Antrim needs to get a major push on because we have a huge population and we're not, we're not, doing sufficient work. We're not sufficiently well resourced as yet to follow the Dublin model. But 
casement is the sort of driver that could achieve that change, really start to move us into a completely different place. Because I see it. You know, we have a huge population. There's almost a million people living in Greater Belfast. Mm. You know, it's the second biggest city on the island. And, uh, you know, you could see conferences being held here, business, political, all the rest of it. I mean, what a facility it will be. Yeah. Uh, why, is there other reasons as to, as to why that potential hasn't been properly explored over the last few decades with, with regards to Antrim GEA? Well, I suppose that y- you would have had a situation where people were coming out of a very dark time in Belfast, inner city Belfast. You know, we were up at the, like, there were Waterford people talking to me at the Antrim Waterford hurling game. And uh, I was saying to them, you know, look, if you just look across here, you're looking into Bally Murphy, you're looking into White Rock, you know, which would have been an epicentre of the troubles, you know, snipers, machine gun battles, you know, um, hunger strikers, you know, rioting on a daily basis, you know, huge devastation in communities, sectarian assassinations, all around Corrigan, just where we were watching that game. You know, and now it's a sort of an oasis of calm. So you, in the, at, the, at the heart of the troubles and all of that, in Belfast there was a preoccupation with daily survival and everything that was going on around. So it was a huge stumbling block. And it, it reversed a lot of the progress that had been made in Antrim during the 60s, 50s and 60s. And, um, I mean, some, some football teams, like, for example, the Ard- Ardoin, Kickhams were completely decimated. I think they lost 12 of their first team during the Troubles. Prison, assassin, you know, murder, all the rest of it. So there's no doubt that we're not in the tra- trajectory that we should be on. There's a lot of good work being done now at grassroots level. We have big numbers, you know, new clubs like St. Bridget's, etc. But Case Park would be very, very important to, to elevate us, to bring us up to a more, I don't like to use the word professional, it's not a, not a word I like to use in the context of what we do, but more serious, and we'll raise our standards. There's no doubt about that, that it will do that. And, um, and uh, obviously resources are massively important, and that's going to be a key driver for resources. Mm. So for all those reasons, it... it uh, and of course, it'll get rid of a, a, a shock and ice. Or I mean, I don't know if you've been up to see it. You should go up and look at it. You yeah. just go, oh my god! Yeah, it's shock. Yeah. Oh, it's shocking. You talked there about a lot of the progress being undone after the sixties. Uh, have the other sports suffered a similar fate? Like, I mean, like you look at something like Star of the Sea, for example, a, a brilliant club that was obviously decimated throughout the troubles as well itself. And I guess if you fast forward to now, you've got, I guess rugby and soccer with their gleaming new stadiums it, does that is that emblematic of the GEA being left behind at all I think that you know uh, in general people would say well isn't it just typical of the north you know I mean John Hume said once if you want to know the sectarian nature of the north look look where the motorways go you know so all the motorways were from Belfast out to Hollywood out to Bangor I mean all exclusively Protestant to Ballymena there's a motorway to Ballymena you know population maybe 25,000 people motorway onto Coleraine you know, motorway that goes as far as Craig Avon, you know, and then a motorway that went to the sort of to the edge of Tyrone, but didn't didn't proceed into West Tyrone. <laughs> you know, a motorway that moves from Belfast stops at Tombridge before it comes to Fenian country. You know, and then you know the the I think the fourth fourth biggest or third biggest city on the island, Derry City, no motorway. So you've got from Timbridge to Derry City, you've got 45 miles, no motorway. And, and so people would say, well, look, isn't it just typical? Gleaming new soccer stadium. You know, and the, the irony of it is the amount of help that the GA gave Irish soccer and helping them with their bid, showing them how to put it together. You know, because it had to be cross-community. So three sports three sports were getting grants and awards at the same time you know I mean Fergal Doherty the great dairy footballer you know the famous heavy hitter he used to you know a lot of his big hits are on YouTube he, he his 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 firm put the roof on the new on the new Ravenhill you know and you've got these sparkling new stadiums and casements sitting as it is
It's a brilliant conversation with you, Owen. You're welcome back. How are you? Yeah, very well. Very well. Conversation there, Joe Brawley, always uh, incredible to, to listen to. And I guess that point there that he, he makes at the end about the, the cross-community nature of getting uh, this thing up and running is a really interesting one if you go back through some of the, the, the history of Casement Park because uh, what, what you might have heard anybody who was with us in the first half an hour of the show was a, a very quick mention of the sporting facility that might have been built on the old side of the maze out near Balmoral and that was supposed to be their gleaming new multi-purpose stadium which of course was uh, originally shelved before the three project plan in 2011 so that's the, the very brief historical context uh, into the conversation that that, that, that we kind of um, that we didn't play at the very start there. So the main problem seems to be that there is an ongoing legal process where there has been objections to the judicial review process where local residents are objecting to the plans to redevelop the stadium. Yes, so we're into the second of those uh, controversies and it will play out after Easter and we need to let uh, due course take place I guess on that front and we will know over the next couple of months if there is going to be another roadblock it is not the only roadblock of course the, the biggest one arguably was when the executive collapsed what is it now five years ago at this point when things looked like they were going to <laughs> the wheels were going to be it is, it's a ridiculous amount of time isn't it yeah well that was the it's, first that was the first executive there has been one since but it has also collapsed yeah, well, the initial, and then there's also this this collapse. And then we're going to have May, where there's hopefully going to be uh, a bright new future on a political sense. But what it really seems to me is that if things will all come together nicely on a political level in May, you've got to act pretty bloody quickly to get things over the line here. And what we've seen is that things move slowly. That was one of the voices in that box pop earlier on. This is Northern Ireland. Things don't happen quickly, he said. And it's very, very true. So it's... It's an absolute nightmare. There's no way of putting it any other way. OK, let's, let's get back to your, your bit with uh, Brawley here. He, here he is talking about life in Belfast in, in 2022 and particularly how East Belfast has changed. You'd be forgiven for thinking immediately, oh, well, here we are. You know, here. But the, we're, we've, we've really moved a yeah. long, long way from that sort of sordid sectarianism. The vast majority of parties have moved a long, long way from that and just are getting on with the business, as John was explaining earlier. But the Casewood Park project was so important that the last thing that the GA could be about it was high-handed. You know, how we take your time, get relationships right at street level there in Belfast. You know, all the things that we've talked about. You know, there could have been easy accommodations made, and in my view, there still could be easy accommodations made. You know, people aren't fundamentally unreasonable. And, you know, if you're spending two, three, four or five million on the delays between judicial reviews, the delays in getting started, having to go again, consultants, new plan, everything else, you know, you can settle this. You can settle this case for the residents, you know. What about when you think about the, the, the future of this city and, I guess, the, the GEA in this city? I mean, you've obviously been involved volunteering uh, around the place for, for quite some time. H have you seen a change? Have you I'm seen not refusing, I'm not refusing to do interviews. And not refusing to do no, interviews? No. <laughs> yes. Um, you were, uh, I interrupted you there. No, I was, I was going to ask about the, what you've seen, how your experience of being a volunteer of, of the GEA in the community, how that's changed and how that's moving forward over the next little while. Like I mentioned to John earlier on, the East Belfast project has been a very interesting one over the last little while. And the, the foundation of that club uh, during the pandemic was, was, a, was a brilliant story. And it's not a new story, uh, it, certainly from what you've been saying here. But I think those sort of moments give people a, a very clear graph of, of how things are moving. And that, that's exactly how sport kind of tells the story sometimes of a place. It will. Again, a friend of mine, in America, he always says demographics is destiny. And so East Belfast would have been traditionally very, very ferociously loyalist. Now you've got a very, very mixed population and a growing mixed population. And, you know, racism is dying out. And in East Belfast, like where I've been involved with the, the groups up there, um, you, they've now got, I think, the third highest membership of any club in the North. They have a significant a minority of people from the Protestant faith involved. And again, it's these social contacts that are far more important than the games themselves.
and the fact that now they're 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 fundraising towards buying ground to build their own facilities. What an endeavour that will be. I mean, you go up you go up there on a Saturday morning now, and there are just squadrons of kids coming in. You know, every every hour a new squad arrives. It's all country folk, of course, by some throne and our man, all of that, who are who are who are leading the charge with it. But overlooking Harland and Wolf, you know, in 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 an area which was notoriously sectarian, to see you know Gaelic games being played, and also it's an exemplar to the local community to say, look, there's nothing to fear here. You know, this is all a bogeyman that's being created. You know, the GAB and the IRA at play that used to be. One of the DUP slogans that the that the the GA was the IRA at play. People are seeing for themselves now, you know. And the president, of course, of the East Belfast Club is Linda Irvine, mm. and Linda, you know, um, comes from the Protestant tradition. She's an Irish speaker. Um, she she um, got her Irish scholarship in Queen's University on a special program, for, you know, for for um, adult adult learners, and. All of that is where the society is going. Can the GEA do more to move away from the idea, obviously the IRA plays a ridiculous notion, but to move away from the idea of nationalism? Should it be doing more to, to do that? Well, I mean, I think that nationalism as a concept is is dying anyway. I mean, I mean Ireland is in a, in a, a sort of a, uh, a, a very strong federation of 27 states and then, I mean, all together, I think of the 40, 48 European countries and dependencies, 45 of them are either in the European Union, in the European free trade area, like the Scandinavian countries with very, very close links, uh, or are applying to join the European Union. There are only three outside Belarus, Russia, and now the United Kingdom. And so in England particularly, I mean, the Scots are trying to disassociate themselves from this. You know, they never voted for Brexit. But in England, they're trying to turn it into a, a tax haven to continue to do what they're doing with the British territories, which are tax havens, British Virgin Islands, all of that, the Caymans. Um, that was the real reason behind the European Union project. And... We see where that nationalism brings you, that xenophobia. We see it in Russia, we see it in Belarus, we see it in England. In Ireland, I think that people are happy to be Europeans now. And increasingly, of course, we go and cheer the team on when they're playing rugby. We cheer the team on when they're playing their big soccer games. Um, but the concept of nationalism, I think that it's dying. Mm. It's dying. You know, and it's dying in the north as well, I believe. I think that you know, we're seeing through Brexit how ridiculous it is, the idea that we should be made to suffer just like the English are suffering now. Uh, and, and, that, and that the protocol should be, you know, ignored and international agreements ignored. I mean, it's just so nonsensical, mm -hmm. you know. Northern Ireland or the North, whichever way you want to describe it, has has suffered enough and we're getting a great boon in trade now at the moment over the last since brexit we've had a great boon in trade i mean you look at, at when i was out in the white house i met the leaders of the belfast chamber of commerce at northern ireland manufacturers association all of them all of them extolling the the virtues of 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 us remaining in the european free tra free trade zone and the massive opportunities that that businesses in the north are taking advantage of it's all a matter of public record mm -hmm. So um, I think that it's all city. I think this election is, is an important one. I don't say pivotal, because life goes on anyway. And politics, to a, very, to a large extent in the North, has often been divorced from real life and reality of your daily life. I mean, during the Troubles, everybody just voted, you just voted green or orange, mm. you know. Uh, but things are very, very different now. And it'll be fascinating to see how it all pans out. All right, there's an election we can all look forward to, Owen, that hopefully maybe has um, some impact. Uh, the last part of this interview, uh, tell us exactly how this worked. So I'm chatting to Joe there in the office of John Finucane, who is a Belfast lawyer, who's also uh, an MP for North Belfast, the first 
uh, nationalist uh, backed MP for North Belfast. He uh, got more votes than Nigel Dodds in 2019 and uh, got his uh, seat, figuratively speaking, in, in Westminster in that election. So it was a truly historical election. Uh, he was a, a mayor of Belfast and he is the son of Pat Finucane, who was uh, murdered at his home in 1989. Uh, they're still fighting for full justice on that at the moment. So uh, John Finucane is, uh, is a figure who's uh, a bit of a hero to many around Belfast. And himself and, uh, and Joe Brawley are friends. But before speaking to, to Joe Brawley, I was, I was in the office uh, speaking to, to John Finucane just for a bit of a play-by-play -play on the Euros bid, why it's important and his own role in it. Well, my understanding is that Windsor Park doesn't have the capacity to deal with uh, a Euro 2028 bid, so it, it really would need to be casement, and, and that is another example of one we're needed as to why we need to have some urgency around getting casement built. It, it's already been too long, but, you know, I, I think to have one of the most prestigious soccer tournaments in the world coming to our shores here, with the potential, I think, around seven matches coming into... West Belfast, I think it will be a huge boost for um, the economy, for tourism here. Um, we can show off our famous Belfast welcome, and I think some of the projections that I read showed that for an investment of around 100 million, it, it, you could be looking at a minimum return of around 217 million. So economically, it, it, it makes perfect sense. But as a sports fan, I, and I am a big sports fan, I think to see the types of matches that the Euros throw up right on your doorstep, being able to bring your kids to that, having that atmosphere here, I think should rally, I think, all political parties to really push to achieve this. It's a bid that's supported by both football associations on the island, by the IFA and the FAI. Uh, and I think that what people want to see here is they want to see political parties work together to secure uh, tournaments like this. Mm. The, the one, I guess, fine the ointment of that is that the DUP don't seem convinced that Northern Ireland will have a part to play in this. Obviously, the collapse of the executive is a significant part of that. They have been the one, I guess, dissenting voice recently when it comes to this idea that Casement Park will be available. Yeah, I, I was critical of, of the of the economy minister. I thought it showed a, a lack of vision and a lack of ambition as to what you know we we should be bringing to our shores here. Um, but I think the reality is that you know Casement Park is going to get built. Um, it's going to be it's going to be a first class stadium, and I think that um, you know sport transcends identity politics here. So football fans will want to see the Euros come into Belfast if there's even a remote possibility of that. They will demand that their political parties support the IFA, they support the FAI and they join the bid to bring that tournament here. So I think a bit of real politic will kick in after the election. We're in a season at the minute um, whereby I think there is a little bit of silliness from some parties, but I think this is just too big an opportunity to miss out on. And for what it's worth, our party in Sinn Féin are, are completely committed um, to this bid and we want to work with other parties to secure that. I guess the other element of uh, not, not criticism of this possible project, but maybe caution around it is, is people who are involved in Gaelic games in this city and in this county because there have been so many false dawns in the past with Casement Park. I know for a fact that there are people within Antrim GEA who, who are very cautious about this idea that Casement Park can be involved in Euro 2028 because it doesn't exist yet and they thought it would exist a long, long time ago. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a fair enough analysis. Um, people just want to get the stadium built first, and then we can we can talk about what matches that it's going to host. Um, there has been progress. It's it's been painfully slow at times for a variety of reasons, um, but we do have planning permission that has been granted. Um, the GAA importantly remain committed to this project, and that's really that's significant. And I think it's important um, for Ulster Gales, but particularly for Antrim Gales, that the GAA remain firmly behind this project. And um, there is a legal challenge, which which I think is due to be heard quite soon um, that will be decided one way or another but I think it's clear that, that the residents of West Belfast want this, the people of Belfast want this, Gales want this, sports fans want this um, You know, we look at, w with a touch of envy at our um, friends in rugby and, and football and they have Windsor Park and they have um, the, the Ravenhill ground as well and I think that we want to see you know, a first class stadium, one of Ireland's best stadiums in, in the country's second biggest city um, and it will be so good for, for, for Gaelic games as I say in both Belfast and Ulster And that, that is the thing, it is part of that three step project to, to redevelop the sporting facilities in this city 
you do have further criticism from the DUP. Paul Frews saying it's sectarian politics that uh, Casement Park is uh, trying to get the wheels in motion at the moment, and then more, more local football projects, uh, the football stadia uh, projects, have been halted at the moment. He thinks that differentiating the two of them is sectarian politics, but I guess the reality is that it was part of the original plan to upgrade Ravenhill uh, and indeed uh, Windsor Park. Yeah, I mean, very briefly, without, I suppose, going into it in too much detail, the reason why... Um funding for sub-regional stadia in, in, in soccer hasn't been able to be um, released is because the DUP walked out of the executive. That has a knock-on effect with what the executive are, are, are able to uh, commit to as far as new decisions. Casement is not a new decision. Um, my, my colleague and the communities minister, which has remit over sport, Dergy Hargy, met and explained this with, with the IFA and, and, and local clubs and I, I think they understand and, and respect that decision. There is a degree of frustration um, with politics that, that because one party walked out, we are unable to release money but I do think that's going to be short term we will have the election in May um, people across the board want to see parties background and, and working with each other uh, and, and delivering so we have big issues like cost of living and, and, and health um, but for me I'm always unashamedly biased when it comes to sport I want to have top class facilities so that children in the next generation have the best options available to them to go on and be the best uh, gale that they can be or, or football player rugby player, athletics, whatever it is and I think it's, um, it, it's a commitment that the political parties must have. So I think there's a little bit of silliness and probably electioneering whenever um, Paul Frew is making making the types of statements that, that he's making. I don't really wish to get down into that. I just want to keep my focus on being able to deliver um, a new casement park for everybody in the city. All right, so that's John Fanucan there speaking with you, Owen. You, you spoke to both of the, the two lads together. Yeah, I, I should mention as well that John Fanucan is a, a former Antrim goalkeeper as well and uh, himself and Joe Brodie would have played a against each other a couple of times, certainly in, uh, in club GEA. So uh, the two of them sat down for a chat as well a short time after that. Joe Brodie has joined us. Uh, Joe, you just said there that you guys go back a long way. Well, I can say with pride that my debut in senior football in Antrim, oh, I loved, I loved John. All six foot three of them. <laughs> He, he stayed on his goal line. He fair, stayed on his goal line. Fair play to you. And you, somebody captured it on video. Really, and to this day, you can see it on YouTube. Well, you can see it because you keep retweeting it every now and then. That's why you can see it. <laughs> uh, we should have had this agreed before the interview started that that wasn't allowed I'd to be mentioned. I have to say, you know, the, the, even the Lav Jarek supporters laughed. I have to say it was terrific. Yeah, it was terrific for. We, we it, was ter it, was, it was it was terrific for for some people. or not everybody. But uh, yeah, Joe's a delight as always. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, what about being kindred spirits off the pitch? When did you discover that that, that was going to be the case? Well, I mean, obviously we're very proud of John. You know, he, he, after you know the adversity that he came through as a child. You know, with his father being shot and all of that. You know, for him to become the Lord Mayor of Belfast, I mean, enjoyed that now. The, the 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 Lord Mayor's limousine and all, and then of course now the first the first um, Sinn Féin MP for North Belfast, and doing a massive amount of work for regeneration of his local community, and someone who's got the right community spirit. You know, and I think you find this in Belfast, sort of working class Belfast, and also with the GAA. You know, feet firmly on the ground and. A vocation for service, so we're, we're very proud of him, I must say. Yeah. That uh, sense of vocation, John, obviously, as as uh, Joe mentioned, it, it comes from a place of real hardship. And is that something that still motivates you to this day? Obviously, there is still quite a campaign going on from your own point of view. I, I, I don't know if it motivates me because you know, there's I mean, there's something in you. I mean, as Joe, Joe talked before about you know, when you're a gale, there's something in you, of, 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 you know, when it comes to certain things, and for me. Um, the law was a natural thing to be interested and involved in because you have the ability to affect change and help people. And I suppose the extension of that politics for me isn't that different. It shouldn't be that different because all you're doing is trying to affect change that's positive and help people. And that comes from you know, your local area to then coming out and talking about bigger issues the way we were chatting about Casement Park earlier on and you know how that's important to deliver on. But I think that you know it's obviously had a huge impact in influencing and probably shaping my own experiences, but I wouldn't say that, you know, my own family's experience drives me on to be involved in politics. Maybe it does. Maybe that's that, that's something that you know other people would be better placed to answer rather than me. But you know, it happened. What happened to me happened to a lot of other people. Happened to many other people. Um, and I think that we're at a time now particularly in Belfast and in the North, where I think people want to see what the vision is for the future. They don't want to necessarily 
go back and refight old battles from the past. And that's, you know, that's what I'm about. There's going to be things that, you know, people are going to disagree on and that's fine. You can do that in, in a healthy way, but it's about delivering for people. You know, again, we're chatting earlier on before Joe came that people are facing real issues here. Cost of living, health waiting lists are the worst on the island. Or if we're talking about sport, you know, we need to see casement up and running. We need to see proper investment in the, in the local sport. That's what people want to see. They don't want to hear me on, you know, arguing about something that people are not going to agree on from 30, 40, 50 years ago. Also, I think that there's n there's no barriers. I mean, I always laugh when I see, when I see John, you know, I remember when he was the Lord Mayor and the big limousine was pulling up, you know, with his driver and all. And there he is, you know, he's at a, he's still doing nets for Lava Tarag, you know, and the boys don't pay a blind bit of notice. And uh, we did that thing, do you remember that car wash thing that we did up in North Belfast? Oh, that's right, I, yeah. yeah. And again, he's there, he's just part of the furniture, you know, nobody makes a fuss out of him. And all that helps to keep your ground, obviously, very apparently, so Apparently it was the first time in the Lord Mayor's history that their office had to keep an eye on Alton Division 1 fixtures because they, <laughs> they didn't want to be fixed anything. They'd be going, I, uh, Lord Mayor, I think you have Ross away that uh, night, or you've, you've Cargan at home, and you went, all oh, right, okay, we'll maybe try and move that to yeah, yeah. facilitate that. Yeah, and it's really, and John obviously is, a, is a, you know, important for a number of reasons. You know, his intellectual ability is, is, is uh, you know, the way that the way that politics are moving here, very, very quickly on the on the sort of nationalist Catholic side, where there's a really, as you say, the past is another world, and it's about getting on with the business, the real business, and you know, obviously there's still the hangover in the south, particularly where I have to say I find it very, very irritating that no matter what I said, it says, oh well, you know, but well, look at what the IRA did 50 years ago and 40 years ago, and no doubt all of that was atrocious, but here, you know, the reality on the ground is that. Uh, the vast majority of parties, with the sort of dishonourable exception of the DUP, are working to affect change and working together and cooperating very well. So you go up to Stormont, you see that, you actually see the relations that are built between people, the personal friendships. You know, the outlier obviously are the DUP who don't engage, don't talk to anybody. I mean, if you ever went into the canteen and I mean, the first time I went into the canteen in Stormont, it was hilarious. And what happens? Well, the DUP sit in the corner with their backs to everyone and don't speak. You know, they don't they don't engage with anyone outside of their own group and that's essential I suppose if you're going to cling to uh, an ideology that doesn't work in the modern world you get I mean I, I talked earlier on about my daughter playing county football I mean my eldest is first year university over in over in Scotland my daughter's just turned 18 um, I would say and I would say Joe's probably the same with his kids you know if any of that social circle started asking about what your political or religious background is you'd be laughed out of you know whatever social setting you happen to be in kids don't care about that they're caring about their exams they're caring about university my daughter's more concerned about who's refereeing or next match you know and you know that's that's what their focus is they're the things that people want to be focusing on it's you know what type of job am I going to get after I go to university and I think that 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 normality I think it's a bit of a cliche, but it's true that normality doesn't sell newspapers. You know, it doesn't make a sexy headline on on um, on TV news. But the reality is that the majority of people here work and live and exist with each other harmoniously on a on a daily basis. And that's why I was referencing. I was saying it before you come in, Joe. One of the sort of strange outworkings when the DUP walked out of the executive is that all of the other parties just went right. We're going to go around them or over them, and you saw a whole swathe of legislation getting passed in a couple of weeks you know whether it was integrated education welfare mitigations um bereave or um bereavement um support for parents who, who are losing Most children same, yeah. yeah and i think it's the first in europe for that so you have all the other parties saying right we are not going to be distracted by one party effectively throwing their toys out of the pram over an agreement between the British government and the European Union, we're going to go around them and over them because we need to deliver for people here. And that's that's what the majority of people want. And I think I think Joe's right. I think that's what you are going to see yeah. post May the fifth. Yeah. The 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 um the day last week when Jeffrey Donaldson and um Jim Allister, etc., you know, were threatening all sorts uh, at, at one of their rallies, I noticed that on that day, very quietly, you would have seen it on Twitter, but you wouldn't have seen it anywhere else, that the that the Shankill Women's Centre uh, had come over to the Falls to spend a day with the Falls Women's Centre, mm. you know, and uh, that's that's the reality here, you know, the 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 old ideas of the troubles. Don't forget now it's twenty three years and counting since the ceasefire. Um, it has no daily relevance to our lives. We don't see it. It's an extremely peaceful city. It's got one of the lowest rates of domestic crime of any city in Western Europe. We're very fortunate to live in this society, 
and my view is that things will just develop organically now in a common sense way because there's no way that we we will go back to 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 the struggle. I mean, the the smaller niche sort of dissident groupings who have zero support, genuinely zero support. I mean, we both work in in, in the criminal law. You know, they're in the process now of sort of the dying embers. I mean, they're they're going to be gone. Uh, no one on the, you know, no one, and we have a very well-educated populace, so people just want to get on. You know, I mean, my oldest boy's in Boston, the second one's in Dublin. Daughter's going to Spain to study. You know, like, who cares about this stuff? You know, you want to get on and love and, you know, be free and, and, and to feel that you're living in a decent, civilised society, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that, in a way, this sort of hate that's been poured out over the last while from the DUP and the TUV, etc., you know, it, it 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 now can be seen for what it is. I have to say, I thought the Simon Coveney thing. Obviously, none of us want to see that type of stuff going on, and it was very very frightening for the gentleman in question. But it probably highlighted how ludicrous all of this is that's going on, you know, and how pointless it is in the longer term. Mm -hmm. I mean, society's moving on here, and if people don't want to get on the train, well, that's a matter for them, really. But it's moving on very, very quickly, like rocketing. All right, a little bit of context there from Owen about everything that's going on around Casement Park. We'll keep a close eye on when the findings of the latest judicial review are made public in April. Uh, well, that's when the judicial review will start. When it actually gets made public, we'll find out after that. Around about half past nine this morning, we're a bit late. Here's what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio today.